But in the first lecture in the series, we looked at this picture of a calm river in declining sunlight and mountains in the distance, painted by Thomas Cole in 1838. Six years later, Thomas Cole would take on a pupil, Frederick Church, who painted this. It's almost five feet wide, and hangs upstairs near the coal. And I want to start us off just by looking at it. I'll show you a few details as we do. You may have noticed the sky first. It occupies more than half the picture, a ragged blanket of thin clouds with pale blue sky showing through. It seems to come up over our heads. Back toward the horizon, the puffs pick up orange flecks on their undersides, which become redder as they approach the bright yellow flare of the sun that's just slid below the horizon. Between the pink sky and the green land, there are pale gray mountains that recede from the highest peak and form a basin further to the right. Nearer to us uh, is a band of low greenish hills, mostly wooded, but with open patches and ponds. To the right, closer still, are some buildings by a waterfall. The largest of them has a cupola. Above and beyond is a cabin and a small clearing. Nearer to us is a road and a man driving a one-horse cart. Closer to us, there's a substantial bridge and a fisherman. A lake where uh, cattle are wading in the shadows, reflects the pink sky. On a knoll on the left side of the picture, a young man sits, leaning back, sits uh, leaning back on an elm tree and looks out at the scene. Well, as you know already, the mountain is Katahdin, a rugged, barren peak in Maine, 300 miles northeast of Boston, that rises abruptly 4,000 feet above the surrounding woodland, rivers, and lakes. Few, if any other people in New York in Church's time would ever have seen it. The mystique of the remote Katahdin was increased by the publication in 1846 of Henry David Thoreau's description of his expedition there. Six years later, 
1852, Church traveled, traveled up there with some lumbermen to Katahdin. And like Thoreau earlier, he encountered bad weather on top of the mountain and didn't describe getting to the summit. When Thoreau had headed off to Katahdin, he brought with him all his enthusiasm for untouched wilderness. But once he got there, his enthusiasm for it, his feelings were mixed because he reported what church must have also seen and perhaps also felt, a new kind of encounter with nature. This is Thoreau. Perhaps I most fully realized that this was primeval, untamed, and forever untamable nature, or whatever else men call it. It is difficult to conceive of a region uninhabited by man, and yet we have not seen pure nature unless we have seen her thus vast and drear and inhuman. Nature here was something savage and awful, though beautiful. Here was no man's garden, but the unhandled globe. It was not lawn, nor pasture, nor mead, nor woodland, nor lee, nor arable, nor wasteland. It was the fresh and natural surface of the planet Earth. In this series, I'm looking at the relationship between what we see uh, in this painting and others and what the artists themselves could have seen and drew. In the case of this picture, we know a lot, thanks to the work done by Franklin Kelly, Theodore Stebbins, and others. But I was curious, and I wanted to go and see for myself what vantage points Church might have worked from, what he imported, imported from elsewhere, or altered, or invented. Well, Church made a drawing in September 1852 that shows the mountain seen from Katahdin Lake, looking west. The lake gives you many vantage points if you're in a canoe. You can see that my picture of last summer corresponds pretty well with the drawing. The bulk of the mountain with its two peaks, Baxter and Pomola on the left, connected by a jagged ridge uh, known to hikers as the knife edge. Uh, from this angle, the ridge makes a, the top uh, look just a bit like an extinct volcano, which it is certainly not. And the so-called Great Basin is in the center. From closer in, Church made three drawings, uh, three more, uh, but because of his technique and some fading, uh, those are hard to make out, and they don't add very much to what we know. Comparing the mountain as it is with the mountain he drew, I think you can see Church exaggerating a bit. He made it taller in the drawing and made its shoulders a bit steeper. And that change carried over uh, into the painting he did in his New York studio months later. Katahdin has become even taller and pointier. But we thought we should be sure because, uh, particularly since one of the drawings has a note by Church that he made it from the south. We thought maybe going around to the south would give us a view more like the painting. The two pictures at the top uh, you've seen before, my photo and Church's Mountain, my faithful guide, uh, the other half of the we I'm talking about, led me to Upper Togue Pond in the middle row, but from there, Katahdin looks quite different. And at the bottom, moving further west, not only is it really hard to see the summit from that quarter, what with thick growth of trees that's come up since that area became a state park a century ago, but when we did get a clear look, it was even less like the painting. So we were right the first time. The point of this is, it's clear Church wanted a more dramatic posture and shape for Katahdin, higher and even more abrupt, and he made it that way to contrast more strongly with the placid settlement down below. This is, of course, completely within the rules of the game for Cole and Church and his contemporaries. Uh, painters were not doing topography, they were making poetry, and some poetic license is expected. Now, whether Church actually witnessed this condition of sky at Katahdin or not, he painted a perfectly credible situation in late afternoon when stratocumulus clouds, which are puffy during the daytime, 
while the air warms up and expands upward, collapse uh, into a flatter layer when the sun gets lower and pick up pink light from the sun as it sends its ray th rays through the thicker air. The wilderness church paints around the mountains is true to actual conditions in these parts, stands of trees interrupted by those low patches that you see, swamps and tangles of um, blow-down trees. Well, you heard Thoreau describe this area as a region uninhabited by man and vast and drear and inhuman, no man's garden. What was never there in reality was this, this lake with a settlement, nor the mill, nor the good road, nor the cattle. In short, everything civilized. They are fictional. Church put them there. And to understand why he did that, we need to introduce Church and consider what he'd been doing. Frederick Church came from a wealthy Hartford family. He studied drawing and painting with local artists starting at 16, and he showed enough promise for his father to ask his friend Daniel Wadsworth, of the Wadsworth Athenaeum fame, a collector and a patron of Thomas Cole, he asked him to persuade Cole to take the boy on as a pupil. For two years, uh, starting in 1844, Church worked under Cole in Catskill, New York, in Cole's house, called Cedar Grove and Studio. Cole did more than teach Church how to paint landscape. Cole was a poet, a Christian believer, and a well-read man. He would produced an essay on American scenery that served as a kind of sermon as well as a manifesto. He was an advocate of what he called a higher kind of landscape, one with a moral function like history painting that could be inspiring as well as beautiful. Cole wrote that there is in the human mind an almost inseparable connection between the beautiful and the good, so that if we contemplate the one, the other seems present. Cole must have talked about these things with Church. Cole believed that American scenery has advantages over Europe. Um, he wrote, the most distinctive and perhaps most impressive characteristic of American scenery is its wildness. In civilized Europe, the prim primitive features of scenery have long been destroyed or modified. The extensive forests that once overshadowed a great part of it have been felled. Rugged mountains have been smoothed, and impetuous rivers turned from their courses to accommodate the tastes and necessities of a dense population. A month after coming to Cole, a uh, church was out drawing the subjects that Cole had made famous, like the Catskill Mountain House, uh, perched on a ledge uh, about 2,000 feet above the Hudson River Valley. Cole's painting is below, and Church's drawing above it, and Catterskill Falls. Cole's painting at the left, and in the center, Church's drawing where he made patient color notes, just as Cole himself had done 20 years earlier. Church began to make oil sketches and small finished paintings, like the one on the right, of various Catskill beauty spots, entirely in the Cole style. Church's debut back home in Hartford was a historical landscape of the type that Cole believed in. This is the 17th century expedition by an ambitious Puritan clergyman called Thomas Hooker and his congregation from Cambridge in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, all the way to Hartford, a hundred miles through what a contemporary had called a hideous and trackless wilderness. <laughs> they, bought, uh, brought a, they brought 160 cattle and the ailing Mrs. Hooker, who had to be carried on a litter. They're riding through a landscape that doesn't look all that hideous, and in actuality they followed paths that had been used by natives for centuries. <laughs> Never mind. They are almost arrived, as you can see, driven on by faith and a radiant setting sun to a broad river that must be the Connecticut River. Church's work in the next few years shows him mastering Cole's Catskill imagery. He develops even more exact ways of rendering details 
as well as subtler techniques for particular conditions of light. Here it's the elegiac light on the Catskill Creek when the sun just disappears. And here, sunrise. The church got up early and drew or sketched in oil events in the sky that have hardly been portrayed by anybody before this. Here he was on the famous escarpment above the Hudson River a Valley as the sun casts light at a low angle on the deck of clouds and gives an effect like the sunset on Mount Katahdin with stripes of salmon on the undersides of the clouds. Cole had painted clouds and mist rising from valleys in the morning. They were part of the vocabulary of effects that Church learned from him. But Cole doesn't prepare you for what Church does with the motif, like this. He gets above the clouds and he lets the clouds get close to him and to us. The distant view is completely blanketed. It's just trees and rocks that form the raggedy edge, probably somewhere near the Catskill Mountain House. And all the rest is vapor, it's immaterial, except for a single hawk in flight. The sun is just up and hidden by a treetop here at the left center. For only a moment, I mean, everything will change. We don't see where we spectators are meant to be standing. This is a vision unlike anything attempted by an American artist yet. The only image that comes to mind is this familiar German one uh, of a well-dressed hiker taking in the view of mist in the mountains by the German romantic painter Caspar David Friedrich. It seems to be about the uncertain, the unknown, contemplated by a man whose face we can't see and who is our doppelganger, our stand-in for us spectators. In the church painting, there is no stand-in. There's no human presence at all, except, of course, our own, which is implied, standing just outside what the artist shows. There's no philosophical posing but I do think there's an invitation not only to enjoy the view, but also to think about the situation we see. The world out there that we take to be solid and permanent is obscured by evanescent veils and the irony of that. We came for the famous long view, we got clouds instead, a different reward from the one we expected. In the same year, a church painted this, as down to earth as you can get. You recognize the cliffs here of West Rock, seen out around Edgewood or Yale Bowl, with the West River winding its way toward New Haven Harbor. In the years before it was straightened out to provide more farmland and later to become part of Edgewood Park. There is a fine balance here between exactness of depiction and breadth of design. Church was a very close observer of skies which he drew over and over most of his life. And the shifting mass here of flat-bottomed cumulus clouds seems precisely recreated, although of course recreated in the studio. The picture is about time, among other things, the millennia that it's taking for this palisade of West Rock to erode, the round of seasons here getting in the hay harvest, and the minute-to-minute -minute movements of the clouds, which cast shadows on the ground and give shape to the composition. The activity of haymaking must have appealed to people as an emblem of well-earned bounty or divine providence. One critic wrote that with this picture, Church has taken his place at a single leap among the great masters of landscape. Well, there's a story about West Rock uh, that gave this view more specific meaning, I think. It, had been the hideout of two heroes in long time, the long time past. They were two revolutionaries, two anti-monarchists during the English Civil War, judges who had actually signed the death warrant of Charles I and who fled to Boston in 1660 after the Restoration and were pursued to Connecticut by soldiers of the crown. Their names were Edward Whaley and William Goff. They lived for a while in a cave on West Rock where local people kept them supplied with food. On the wall of the cave, they wrote their motto, 
Opposition to tyrants is obedience to God. Goff and Whaley were regarded around here at least as precursors of American revolutionaries a century later. And West Rock was, around here at least, a landmark of democracy before its time. Now, Church knew the story because Cole knew it. Cole was put it on a list of subjects that he was going to use for poems that he would write about the two regicides and a third regicide, regicide uh, uh, whatever you said, regicide, uh, John Dixwell, who lived in New Haven under an assumed name. Whaley, Goff, and Dixwell are names we mainly know as the three long straight streets that converge at that insane roundabout right by the Yale gym. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> Thomas Cole had traveled to Maine and discovered Mount Desert Island as a subject a year before Church uh, became, uh, be became his apprentice. And while Church was with him in Catskill, Cole had painted some rousing pictures like this of the stormy ocean and rocky shore, subjects that were new to him and to Church. For Cole, they were another display of the sublime in nature, dangerous and thrilling. Cole wrote in his diary, the whole coast along here is iron-bound with threatening crags and dark caverns in which the sea thunders. When Church got there in 1850, he found the main climate exhilarating. When he could work in good weather, he used the sparkling sunset to sketch the amazing interpenetration of sea and mountains on the island, and also the play of warm colors of, of sand and rocks against the lavender slopes and background of the bare granite heights. But what distinguished Church from Cole and other painters was his feeling for the opposite of all that, all that clarity. It's the fog that hangs uh, on the horizon, beyond the point of land in the distance on the left, waiting to, be, to creep back to land. He's completely mastered the action of the waves. And more remarkable and new is the picture on the right, the very simple painting of a boat, solid, heavy, where the fog is close to shore. And it makes a dazzling veil that obl obliterates anything that might be out there. The picture added to Church's reputation in New York as a painter of particular sensitivity. At the National Academy at the same year, Church showed a painting that's startlingly different uh, from the West Rock and the atmospheric main pictures, a theatrical sunset with a poetic title from Milton, Twilight, short arbiter twixt day and night. He evidently had two oil sketches on hand in the studio that um, he combined in this picture, taking the rock formation and the house uh, from the one on the upper left, and the sunset over the mountains from the one below. The result was an imaginary place with a disturbingly real and vivid feeling. Maine is where Church first was inspired to pull out all the stops. This painting uh, followed on the twilight, <clears throat> and it has a radically simple composition. It's based on an oil sketch of a colorful sunset to which Church added rocks and a day beacon. It's the most complex and lurid and portentous sky yet, and it's an invitation to speculate about the potential symbolism. The waters out off of Mount Desert have many rocky shoals waiting to wreck ships, like the little one at the right on the horizon. Not all the shoals are visible, even in the daylight, so the beacon is there to warn them, warn them um, those, who can, those who can see it, that is. It's one of those cautionary metaphors about life and its hazards, seen and unseen, that church looks for in nature or creates believably. This type of picture is not exactly allegory, but it's purposely suggestive. It's what Franklin Kelly calls a landscape of higher association. Church's friend in New York, James Lennox, owned several paintings by Turner, including these two uh, at the top, which we assume Church would have seen. 
Church was far from ready to follow Turner's radical exaggerations, but he must have been excited by Turner's sun and sky, and above all, encouraged by Turner's way of giving all over unity and seriousness to landscape. Church's first trip to Maine was just one of his excursions to New England to gather material for his paintings. So far, we've been looking at sensational subjects, mysterious fogs, towering cloud formations, and also at trees, and fields, and mountains, meticulously depicted in painting that established Church, who's still in his mid-twenties, as the successor to Cole, as the landscape painting painter of his generation. What elevated his standing even higher was a series of pictures related to Mount Katahdin in theme, which was not the beauties of the land, but the situation of white settlers on the land. Cole had created this type while Church was working alongside him seven or eight years earlier. These are two large pictures by Cole showing settlers in remote New England places who have cleared the land. You, you can't miss the stump, stumps here and logs. They made homes with their own hands and are now living in a state of happy self-sufficiency. The father returns with fresh kill, deer in one, uh, fish in the other, to be greeted by his grateful family. Their America, in this painting, is an earlier state of development in its Arcadian or pastoral state. That's the term Cole gave it in his five-part cycle called The Course of Empire. He gave it to the condition after the primitive, but before full civilization. After that, civilization goes way downhill. Um, <laughs> here, the settlers' hard work and ingenuity are rewarded. While Church was in Cole's studio in the Catskill, trees were being felled for a railroad line. And Cole lamented bitterly at the price of progress and the rewards of greed. But neither Cole or Church had given up on the ideal of a life in balance with nature. Many of their clients made their money in railroads and commercial development, financial schemes to fund them. They favored a sunnier view of progress. And Cole gave it to them with an earnestness that looks naive to our skeptical eyes. Church also portrayed that optimistic face of civilization with complete conviction, but on a bigger scale and with breathtakingly exact technique. He did that, above all, in this panorama he compiled from various observations he made in his travels. We see green mountains with rocky outcrops, cultivated upland farms, a village with a steeple, a broad river fed by waterfalls, cattle on the sandbar, and on the sturdy bridge down below, a young woman playing with her dog. We've seen some of these things in Mount Katahdin. Near the falls is a mill. It's a pretty substantial little operation. It makes something, clearly, like the little building with the cupola in Mount Katahdin. It signals development beyond agriculture. <clears throat> the picture is large, and the image is both comprehensive and carefully detailed. This combination of landscape, in landscape painting would soon make Church the painter of American scenery, not just a more North American scenery. One of the discoveries of the past 35 years has been the influence in this country of Alexander von Humboldt, the natural, a German naturalist and master of all sciences and author of Cosmos, which came out in English a, a decade before. Humboldt called for landscape paintings that were like written descriptions, showing what he called the natural world in all its rich variety of forms, capable of linking together the outward and inward world. Paintings, he said, needed both a mass and variety of distinct impressions recorded in notes and drawings, as well as imagination. That way they could constitute what he called heroic landscape painting where intellect brings together facts from nature and the powers of art. It's generally agreed that Humboldt's ideas 
encouraged a church to practice the detailed kind of comprehensiveness that we start to see in New England scenery, this picture, and which is a great contribution to his, which is the great contribution of his lands, large landscapes that are soon to come. Now here I'm drawing on ideas about artistic imagination and precise detail in a book published a couple of years ago by the Yale Press called Frederick Church, The Art and Science of Detail by Jennifer Rabb, who teaches here at Yale in the History of Art Department. There have been a lot of studies on Frederick Church. This one is the most stimulating and clarifying, and it's in print. Uh, <laughs> look, look back uh, now at Katahdin. The church was attracted by the wild and remote character of the region. Nobody lived there. So what are these buildings doing in this picture? The cabin, the mill, the good road, the bridge, the man driving a buggy. Not because Church saw them, but because he imagined them to be there one day. His picture is not about wildness, or even less a nostalgic celebration of a simpler past. It's a vision of the first steps in a hoped-for time to come, when even here in a tiny remote community, machinery would harness nature without harming it. Instead, it would sustain a small population of people who live lightly on the land. And all of this in tacit distinction to the profiteering by lumber companies, tanners, and mill owners. The Katahdin um, has uh, another thing that may have, church, may, may, may have made church and his audience um, think of the future, the sun that goes down in the west. The setting sun sometimes carries the suggestion of the end of an era, but here I can imagine that Church has absorbed and visualized an idea that Thoreau had put in his journal a few years before. I'm quoting him now. Westward is heaven, or rather heavenward is the west. The way to heaven is from east to west around the earth. The sun leads it and shows it. The stars, too, light it. In another place he writes, the man is blessed who every day is permitted to behold anything so pure and serene as the western sky at sunset, while revolutions vex the world. Well, the way to heaven is from east to west. Prompted by Thoreau's journal, which since he had, it wasn't published yet, church, church didn't see, prompted by it nevertheless, let me try out for you a gloss for the painting, uh, or paraphrase of my own, something like this. Katahdin is almost as far east as you can go in America, and east is a place of vexation and revolutions. American people have settled this place in the wilds of Maine, but however well adjusted their life is here, the divine calls them away to the west, toward heaven. I think the church suggests that however fine it will be that Maine is gently settled the way he shows, the future lies where prospectors and ranchers and merchants had been heading in droves and boatloads. The great migration had long begun, long before the California gold rush began in 1849, and 48 and 49. Thoreau wrote that the West is heaven in 1851, and church painted this in 1853. It's been suggested that the covered wagon that we were looking at down in the lower left uh, in Church's other idealized image of New England might carry a similar implication for America's future, that the future lay far away from New England. While we're back to uh, this picture, uh, remember th the, that the mill that Church paints here is small, uh, perhaps for suggesting, suggesting that it's the, maybe the first one on this site in any case, um, Church imported it from Mount Desert Island, where he'd made a drawing of a similar mill. But the mill is not as big or sturdy as the one he imagined and imported to his lake in Maine, um, which is prosperous enough to have a cupola for decoration, or maybe to call the workers from wherever it is that they live. It brings to mind the mill and another painting here at Yale uh, of 20 years later, uh, where it becomes a subject for Winslow Homer. 
the broken windows here, like the cabin and the overgrown field behind, speak of changing economic times before the monster mills and their huge workforces made tiny local operations like this one obsolete. Well, the success of these broad, all-encompassing views like Katahdin and this one gave church confidence. There could be fame and fortune from pictures like this, full of elaborately rendered detail, drawn from close observation, and given breathtaking atmospheric effects. Soon, church was going to have much bigger ambitions. Meanwhile, though, he devoted some of his time in the 1850s to a theme that seemed surefire with his New York clients, affluent city dwellers, remote places, that is, blessed with spectacular evening light shows, settlers and sunsets, you could say. I mean, here's a, 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 another cabin by a lake. Its windows reflect the last blaze of the sun. There are cattle in a modest clearing and people out in a boat. It's the pastoral ideal, again, reenacted in America, plus flaming orange clouds. In a few pictures, church does away with cabins and contented cellar, settlers and serves up something different, an uneasy barrenness instead as a foil to the glory of the clouds. And rather than letting us spectators look down from an elevated vantage point, Church makes us imagine ourselves on that curving bit of path that leads to a mudflat and shallows. For all the spectacle of in the sky, we're drawn into a still uncivilized place, especially compared to Katahdin, where we spectators occupy an undefined place in an agreeable location. The most famous of all these luminary spectacles came seven years later. But it belongs here, I think, in a discussion of Church's career. This picture went beyond anything he'd painted before to dramatize the resplendent sky. Uh, one of my teachers, Barbara Novak, described the clouds as ordered formations of perfectly observed alto cumulus whose flame-like shapes their reflections suffusing the still landscape below enact Baroque ecstasy. <laughs> I, can't, I can't top that. So, <laughs> I, Church recreated the sensations, though, I think of confronting primal nature with no trace of human habitation or presence. I think these are feelings of awe, beyond awe, unnerving doubts about what might come next. Some of this comes from not knowing where you are in this composition. There's no clue to where we might be standing. No topographical information from the picture to help. It's often suggested that Cole was prompted by his own forebodings about the State of the Union as the debate over slavery and states' rights were, was generating, degenerating into hostility. Uh, in another lecture, I'll show you a painting by Gifford that may have been inspired by this one, and it also has been connected to what some historians call the mood of the nation. More on that later. But one reason to suppose, it has been supposed, that this picture had a political reference is the image that appeared later, a year later, on the right, <clears throat> Church's own patriotic statement after the Confederate attack in April on Fort Sumter. Here he recycled uh, sunset uh, into a tattered Union flag, a summons to rally around. The picture was issued in a chromolithograph form as our banner in the sky. Jennifer Rabb calls it the soundbite version of Twilight in the Wilderness. Church was even more ambitious than these pictures would lead you to suspect. In April 1858, after he had finished this picture, he left New York with a friend to spend six months in Bolivia and Ecuador, traveling by ship, riverboat, and mule. He was 26. He should have gone to Europe for a grand tour. Why the tropics of South America? Well, a little earlier I mentioned Humboldt and his book Cosmos. Stephen Jay Gould called Humboldt probably the mo world's most famous and influential intellectual. 
Among others, he influenced Charles Darwin and Louis Agassiz. He began as a geologist and developed into a botanist, a geographer, a cartographer, an all-around scientific humanist. He spent five years in South America and took the rest of his life to publish his findings in 34 volumes illustrated. Cosmos was kind of synthesis in five volumes. It came out in 1852, and Church owned it and read it. Humboldt wrote that he wanted, and I'm quoting him now, to represent nature as one great whole, moved and animated by internal forces. For Humboldt, nature was what he called a harmony blending together all created things, however dissimilar in form and attributes. Humboldt had a comprehensive idea of the causation of things in nature. He took two points of view in his work, first looking at phenomena, purely objectively, and then, as he said, those things as a reflection of the images impressed by the senses upon the inner man, upon his ideas and feelings. Humboldt's thoroughness and his exactness of observation must have impressed Church. His description of a tropical world rising through grassy temperate zone all the way to snow and eternal ice at the top of an active volcano, this must have enthralled him. And Humboldt believed in painting. He aimed a question at European painters that Church took as a summons to himself. Are we not justified in hoping that landscape painting will flourish with a new and hitherto unknown brilliancy, said Humboldt, when artists of merit shall more frequently pass the narrow limits of the Mediterranean, and when they shall be enabled far in the interior of continents, in the humid mountain valleys of the tropical world, to seize with genuine freshness of a pure and youthful spirit on the true image of the various varied forms of nature. Church returned to New York in the fall with a great load of drawings and sketches, and he spent much of the following two years on large paintings of South American subjects. <clears throat> Just to pick one, this is a six-foot-wide panorama of scenery put together out of many different observations, from the most breathtaking snow-covered volcanoes to the smallest birds and animals. All this a kind of catalog of natural wonders made more wondrous for North Americans by the fact that in Ecuador, four seasons could exist simultaneously. <laughs> Church could demonstrate Humboldt's ideas about ecosystems and the interdependency of altitude, geology, water, animals, and plants. Nobody in Church's audience had ever seen such a picture. It was easy to imagine this place as a New Eden the couple uh, here at the Wayside Shrine encouraged that idea. Like the mission uh, in the far distance uh, here, which you can just see, mm, um, it's, they're not, they, this couple, are not yet spoiled. The audience was encouraged to examine every detail because the artist had actually been there and you could believe what you saw. All this is permeated and animated by a radiance from the sun that binds everything together. For many people in church's audience, that light was divine. The picture confirmed that church was more than a painter of New England scenery. He was a man ready to go far afield and to work on a grand and even audacious scale. The following spring, a church traveled to the most famous natural wonder of the new nation, Niagara Falls, and he made drawings there. Artists had been doing that for half a century, making paintings and prints that usually stressed, stressed the great breadth uh, of Niagara Falls, as well as their height at the top. Uh, John Trumbull made a panorama uh, for a house uh, owned by a client in 1880. Uh, in the middle, John Vanderlyn painted the falls so that the smaller American falls slightly upstaged the larger Canadian, uh, British, Horseshoe Falls, uh, and he made the trees look like victims of violence in nature. He lets us survey all of that from a safe distance. Church's drawings 
resulted in an oil sketch at the bottom for his project of making a large painting. Here the idea is completely different. He leads the spectator up close to the top of the falls as though we were standing on that little bit at the lower left, that little bit of shore. From there we see the sheer breadth of the river and the inexorable movement of the water towards the edge. When he finished his painting in 1857, it was astonishing. It was eight feet, uh, 10 feet wide in its frame, and it, you could say it was immersive, or uh, almost. You're, you're alarmingly close to the water. Um, that bit of land in the sketch is gone, and all we have left is a branch. And who knows, is it floating or stuck? In any case, you get close to the picture, and you the wide angle format makes the image almost fill your field of view. Uh, you can see almost anywhere you look that the water doesn't all stream forward uniformly. Here and there it eddies and dawdles in choppy little pools that are deceivingly calm looking. The height is something that you feel and assume. Stressed uh, church doesn't really uh, exaggerate it. The weather isn't dramatic, but the sun from behind the spectator makes a rainbow uh, in the mist ahead of us. The church made the picture to thrill people from a distance and then to intrigue and involve them in discovering its infinite particulars. The picture was shown all by itself in 1857. You paid 25 cents admission. You were permitted, actually encouraged, to use opera glasses so as not to miss a thing. And your quarter entitled you to a pamphlet that reprinted the ecstatic reviews that the picture got in the papers and magazines. You could also sign up for reproductions of the painting, which were reprinted in England in huge numbers. Church's Niagara might remind some of us who were old enough uh, of Cinemascope when we were kids, the first super widescreen color movies and its successors, Panavision, Todd A.O., where there was both the illusion of being enveloped as well as relatively high resolution giving sharpness and steadiness to reinforce the sense of presence. Um, of course, the movie techniques um, were all descendants of 18th century painted panoramas like John Vanderlyn's uh, wraparound a picture uh, of the gardens at Vers Versailles and so was Church's Wide Angle Niagara. So this show business style of promotion for a single painting was quite familiar to London audiences, but new to the United States. In a couple of weeks, 100,000 people came to see the Niagara. It toured other eastern cities, it went on to England and then France. Church sold it to his dealer with reproduction rights for $4,500, and then 20 years later, it went to the Washington banker William Corcoran for the then huge price of $12,500. If you missed the chance to buy a chromolithograph of the exhibition, there was a black and white engraving available as well. It became the most famous picture in America. That year, Church went back to Ecuador for a couple of months of sketching, and he painted this. 15 feet wide in its frame, or should I say stage, um, presided over by the first three presidents at the top. It had a public unveiling in the gallery that had been built in the 10th Street Studio um, building where a church worked and other artists, and again, a later, a solo engagement where it was presented in gaslight with flames concealed behind silvered reflectors. Heart of the Andes was Church's most ambitious statement about the grandeur and the infinite complexity of nature exemplified by this region, which one writer called a complete condensation of South America into a single focus of magnificence. <laughs> it was, another writer said, an intellectual feast that caught the simple truth and the exalted poetry of nature and transferred them to canvas. The feast was uh, indigestible to some other critics. <laughs> But the public um, seemed hardly to get enough of it. Um, 
It has the overt religious references we saw in his scene in Ecuador of four years earlier, native converts at a shrine, and in the distance, a large mission. Church's picture is more simply organized and even more profusely and minutely detailed. Again, opera glasses were encouraged. The picture set off a debate over conflicting ideals in landscape painting. On the one hand, the need to have and preserve large pictorial conceptions unified, and the other, to display a wealth of dis detailed observations generally understood uh, were underlying messages about the mind of God reflected in the seeming great order of things. In that year, Church banked the $10,000, he was paid for the picture, and the money he'd earned from admissions and sales. He got married in the following year and bought a hill farm south of Hudson, New York, with a view across the river to the Catskill Mountains that he'd painted and to the house where he'd studied with Thomas Cole. He turned the property uh, into a working farm and built what he called a feudal castle called Olana. He designed it himself uh, with the aid uh, of Calbert Vox in a fanciful, kind of eclectic style that he called Persian. <laughs> it's the artist's, uh, it is, I think, the greatest artist's house in America. Church had traveled in 1868 for half a year in the Middle East, in Greece, Turkey. The result of the trip was a wealth of drawings and sketches, and eventually a series of paintings of Eastern subjects, Jerusalem, Petra, Athens, the coast of Syria, that would be worth a lecture in themselves. Olana is open to the public. <clears throat> it has a collection of church's drawings and sketches and other works, and you should go there without fail. Um, leave time for a visit uh, across the river uh, to Cole's house in Catskill. Both houses have excellent regular exhibitions. I need now to cut short uh, Church's long career and his many travels. I'm going to show you just one more major work of the 1860s before coming back to <coughs> Katahdin and Maine. After the exhibition of the Heart of the Andes uh, ended, Church went off on a steamer from Boston to Newfoundland and Labrador and Greenland uh, to witness another natural wonder that few people in his audience had ever seen. Icebergs. It cannot have been easy for Church to imagine rivaling his own Niagara Falls or Heart of the Andes for showy novelty, but he managed to do that. The painting is about the same size as the Heart of the Andes, and it's the strangest possible counterpart to it. Again, we spectators are much more are uncomfortably close, let's just say, than, than ever. The, on the ice, we were just steps away from the broken mast of a sailing ship whose voyage ended, ended badly, ground to pieces, and all we can see of it, ironically, is the crow's nest where we might imagine the lookout high above the deck searching in vain for a rescue. That's a detail the church added two years later, before the painting went to England for exhibition. The New York public, before that, saw no trace of human life. There's science here, too. The boulder, the boulder there, perched on and imprisoned in the ice, is a reminder that long ago the ice was part of a moving glacier that scoured the land, picked up rubble like this, and then broke off into the sea and melted. We have oil sketches that show how Church experimented with this composition. Where the boulder is, there was a ship. And you see how the size of the ship made the scale of the iceberg so, so much bigger. Before that, um, Cole had, yeah, and here, um, an earlier idea to have the ship in the middle. But he thought better of it and painted it out. Uh, in New York in 1861, you'd have seen no ship and no broken mast, just ice and water. There's knowledge um, here on display, uh, also wonderment at the glistening surfaces. 
at the amazing turquoise of the ice seen through the water and the electric blue of the glacial ice, which, uh, because it absorbs the entire spectrum, except blue, it reflects blue. And the blue sometimes appears in stripes, like this one on the left, where at some remote time, crevasses filled with water and froze. Church serves up knowledge together with quantities of a novel kind of sublime, to use the language of Romantic era. Vast, gorgeous, uh, lifeless place that's alarming and perversely pleasing in its utter remoteness and superhuman power. Back now, uh, finally, to Katahdin, eight years later, earlier rather, Church's first trip to a remote place. I want to say a little more about the picture. Quite a while ago, I said that the tidy little mill wasn't actually there, that Church inserted it into what was still a wild country of forests and swamps, rivers and lakes. He did the same with the clearings, the cabins, the road, the bridge, and the cattle. So why? I suggested already that the picture is about the future and that Church is projecting onto the land around Katahdin a future that's productive, not destructive. A vision that people, having settled in the wilderness, can prosper by using the land moderately, as these settlers seem to be doing. Beyond that, there may be a suggestion of a grander American destiny in the West, what Thoreau called the way to heaven. Like Cole and other artists of his time, Church believed that nature was God-manifested, and that landscape painting at its highest could demonstrate God's presence and his divine plan. There are windows uh, in the little cabin in the field here, and windows in the mill itself. I think church meant for viewers, those who wish to anyway, to see God in those windows. I think so, because this is a persistent motif in church's paintings of settlers in the wilderness. The golden setting sun is reflected in their windows. I think it's not far-fetched to think that church intended a message by that, that God is present not only by na in nature, but also in these buildings. Church organized this picture on a familiar pattern. He knew it from his teacher, Thomas Cole, who got it from British painters, who got it from the 17th century, Claude Lorrain. Composition, little formulas, who every, which every artist knew in one form or another. The elements are the foreground, bracketed by trees, the water beyond, the livestock, the deep distant view with or without classical buildings, the gentle light, and the air of peace and harmony. In previous centuries, these things combined to evoke Arcadia, far from the city, the imaginary home of shepherds. In the American imagination, this combination associated the settlers with ancient virtues, with that might be admired by city people who bought the pictures. In painting an America of the future, Church has adapted a European formula that was centuries old. Where classical buildings might have been, now there's a little settlement. And Church has included something else in his picture besides the settlement. It's a telling detail that I've already pointed out. I've removed it for a moment to show you that without it, we're simply taking in the scene. It's just us, and we're seeing it from a high vantage point, well above the hill, a position that is not explained by anything we see in the picture. Yes, the boy is gone. <laughs> I've put him back. Um, and I want to say that this restores Church's larger idea. The young man is not drawing or writing, but he's contemplating this place where his future lies. We see that because we have a higher vantage point. 
and therefore a view of him as well as what he sees. And of course, he's a stand-in for a church's spectators too, and I mean you and me, and anybody ready to be moved and inspired, like the young man, by what's here, what's here to be seen and thought about. In the next lecture, the sun goes down again, back in the Catskills, in this large and wonderful painting by Sanford Gifford, which has been away in an exhibition but returns to the galleries next week. So I hope you'll join us. Thank you.